What is up, everybody? Mr. Percy here. Welcome to 5.2. We're going to have three parts on this. This is on revolutions. This is part A. We're going to do causes of political revolutions in the Americas, 1450 to 1750. Just a quick thing from a personal standpoint as an AP World teacher and just kind of uh, what some other teachers do. For AP World, for College Board, you they only require that you know about the revolutions that we're going to talk about today in the Americas. The kind of tricky thing about this is there's a revolution at the same time going on in France that really interacts with some of these revolutions, but the College Board, the AP World people don't require you to know it. And most history teachers like myself love the French Revolution. But for these videos, I'm not going to focus on the French Revolution at all. And I'm really just going to focus on the ones that are required. Um, in class, I'll talk more about the French Revolution. There's a lot of good stories that go with it. It's really just kind of an interesting, like fascinating picture of what revolutions are like. Um, I'm going to post a link to the French Revolution causes and outcomes in, uh, in the video here. So you can take a look at it if you do want to watch some more about the revolutions. But it's not required. So I don't want to confuse people and get you kind of caught up learning about something else. With that said, let's do a little cause of the revolutions. As always, let's do a little contextualization here. 1450 to 1750, kind of some of the stuff leading in. Um, first is we obviously have European exploration going on and the Americas was colonized. So all of these places that we're going to talk about today really are places that are were under European rule at some point. And essentially, not only were they being controlled by the Europeans, and although it's different, and remember, we talked about Spanish Latin America was directly controlled and North America was kind of loosely controlled, they're still under rule of another country. And they do, most people do consider themselves subjects of that country, but still, the way they're treated isn't fair to, in the minds of some people. We also are having this mercantilist system where this wealth is really leaving the hands of the colonists and going to Europe. Now, there are wealthy people in the colonies, but for the most part, we're talking this wealth is really concentrating um, wealth in the power of uh, European countries, whether it's the East India Trade Company, whether it's the monarchs. These people are the ones who are making money, and they're mainly subjects. Um, they live in Europe. So we do, like we said, we do have this nobility, we have the kings, we have this merchant that's going to grow, and we have this mercantilism. Also, there's really this with exploration comes this new mentality over the course of 300 years, obviously, of this new vision of the world or this new view of the world where the world is now bigger than just this European or our small town or whatever. We see things in a bigger, broader picture and the people are going to start kind of questioning human's place in it, which really leads into one of the big things which is going to cause all of these revolutions which is the Enlightenment. So let's start with this. We have three revolutions in the Americas during this period. And I just want to point out, we have one which is going to be here, which is in the 13 colonies, which I have here is American independence. We can get into this debate later with all three of these, but the question becomes, are these really revolutions or are they more independence movements? And by revolutions, to be a revolution, you really need a complete overhaul of the system, whether we're talking about the Neolithic revolution or the scientific revolution, um, the question becomes, is what's going on in the 13 colonies and eventually the United States a revolution or, or, do they do, or do they just get independence and keep most of the same stuff there? Or is gaining their independence enough for a revolution? So that's here. This is the kind of North American or 13 colonies or American Revolution. We also are going to talk about the Haitian Revolution, which is right here. Haiti is part of this island. This half is known as the Dominican Republic. This half is Haiti. And then we have Spanish Latin America here, which goes all the way down. So it's pretty much everything except in South America, except for Brazil and uh, Guyana here. And so we're coming all the way down south. So those are the three that we're talking about. Um, I'm going to go through the cause of each of them. This is going to kind of move fast here. And I don't want to confuse you too much, but I really just want to go. The dilemma here is, do I tell you all about the American Revolution or do we do causes in each? And I decided to do causes in each because I think it helps us compare them a little better. And then the next video will be on the outcomes and we'll kind of compare those outcomes and then we'll try and piece it all together in class. But in terms of the causes of the American Revolution, we got three main things. Now, there's more than three causes, but these are the three that really kind of stand out as most significant in the minds of many historians. The first is the Enlightenment. Now, with the Enlightenment is part of almost part of the contextualization piece, but really the Enlightenment is going on at the same time as the American Revolution happens. And in the American Revolution, the, the main thinkers, the founding fathers, if you want to call them that, are really going to be readers and discussers of Enlightenment ideas. And some of the people who are involved in the American Revolution are almost Enlightenment thinkers themselves. This like Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, these are people, who, and Madison, Monroe, these are people who wrote and contributed and built on the foundation of the John Locke's and the Montesquieu's 
to talk more about specific ways that the Enlightenment could be implemented practically into a country. So there's really this belief amongst American revolutionaries that there's progress, that we need to use reason, that there's democracy. And the whole idea is that we are going to question the government. And by questioning the British crown, we are doing something that's really illegal, but we're also looking to improve our status and the status of our future country. Also, there's an increase in taxes. During, in 1763, there was the French and Indian War, also known as the Seven Years War. This war was between the French and the British throughout the world, but there was a piece of that that was going on in North America. For the most part, if we come back here for a second, this part right here of, the, of North America on the coastline was part of the 13 colonies. Then there was the Appalachian Mountains right here, and then the other side was the French. And a war broke out between the British colonists and the French colonists. And the British sent soldiers to help out their colonists, as you would imagine the mother country would. And the British essentially win this war. And there's a whole bunch of things that come out on this. And but the first one I just want to mention is the, it costs money to fight this war. And the British crown decides we're going to raise taxes on the colonists since we just fought a war to help protect them against the French and the Native Americans. And as a result, the colonists have their taxes go up, taxes on things, on everything, tea, stamps, sugar, um, a whole bunch of products that the colonists were using on a day-to-day -day basis. And the colonists aren't happy with this because who wants to have their taxes raised? As a result, because the colonists hadn't really been taxed much up to that point, because if you remember in the last time period we talked about, North America is really loosely governed um, by the colonists and are not as strict rules. So now all of a sudden, after 150 years of rule, we're suddenly coming in and saying, you got to pay these taxes and the colonists don't like it. So we have some anger over that. Last is, as part of this deal with the French and the Native Americans, there was an agreement made that the British colonists wouldn't move across the Appalachian Mountains and would limit their settlement to the Appalachian Mountains and east. And as a result of that, some people in the colonies believe that it's limiting on, limiting their freedom of movement. So that's that's kind of the three main things we got going on there. And these things are all going to lead to the revolution, which is going to start in 17, 17, try again, 1776, which is uh, begins with the Declaration of Independence, where the colonists declare their independence from the crown. Second thing we got going on is Haiti. Again, I want to come back here, just put in your map. Haiti is in the Caribbean. Haiti was under French rule. And it was France's most profitable colony. It made the most money for France because it was a heavy production of sugar. It was almost entirely sugar production. So it's really what's called, we call a cash crop or single crop economy where it's all about sugar. And unlike today where you can buy a bag of sugar for a couple dollars, back then it was seen as a very high priced commodity or something that not everyone could grow. So one, I just want to point out that it's, a, it's under colonial rule. So it's under the French rule. Two, it has chattel slavery and 85% of the population in Haiti were enslaved. That is a huge number. We're talking compared to the 13 colonies, which was maybe overall 5% slaves. We're talking 85%. So the numbers are in favor of slaves and they hadn't really successfully rebelled up to this point because of the difference in language, of the of psychological and physical violence that was perpetrated or put onto the slaves. We have, do have a small percent of free blacks, people who are freed by their slave owner, um, either while their slave owner was alive or it was written into their the will of the slave owner that when they died, their slave would be freed. So we have 5% free blacks. Then we have 10% whites who are mainly of French descent, who um, there's both rich whites and poor whites and we're kind of all across the board, but that's our breakdown. Half of all slaves who went to the Caribbean ended up in Haiti. So that just tells you the number and the slavery in Haiti is chattel slavery. It is harsh, it is cruel, it is inhumane, and it is it's really horrific. Also, I wanna point out that there is, um, the Enlightenment and the American Revolution are going to inspire the Haitian Revolution. There is a small percentage of slaves in Haiti who are educated and are hearing about the Enlightenment. Um, one is the, actually the leader of the Haitian Revolution, which is Toussaint L'Ouverture right here. Um, and we do have this percentage of people who are hearing these enlightenment ideas. Now you got to remember, you can be treated horribly, but without the ideas to implement something, a lot of people don't have that light bulb moment that we talked about in the last video. So you need the enlightenment and the inspiration from other revolutions to have people understand and have the courage to do what is necessary because just this system of slavery had been in place for 150 years. And now we need like 
almost the straw that breaks the camel's back or that light, like I said, the light bulb to go off. So the Enlightenment and these other revolutions are going to inspire the Haitians to rebel. And one thing that's really going to be significant is not only the, the American Revolution, but also the French Revolution. Because it's a French colony and France goes through a revolution in 1789, rumor spreads to Haiti from France that the king of France wants to free the slaves, which was totally not true. Wasn't what he thought. But... The rumor spreads like kind of the telephone game or whisper down the lane where it gets to Haiti and the slaves are hear that. And they're like, oh, the king wants to free us. Let's rise up against our slave master. So that's Haiti. And last but not least, we have Spanish Latin America. This should be pretty much this part's kind of a review. And if you're getting the hang of this, it's a lot of the same stuff. So number one, we have colonial rule. The Spanish have been in charge of Latin America since the 1500s. Um, and they are strict mercantilism. So a lot of people don't like this rule. Also, we have a French king who had overthrown the Spanish monarch in the early 1800s. And I don't want to get into this story because we don't need to know for here. But if you know the name Napoleon, it's Napoleon's brother who was put in charge of Spain. And that new French king who is the king of Spain but is French, say it again, the king of Spain who is French, the people in Spanish Latin America are like, we got no loyalty to this guy. This We've been loyal to our Spanish king even though we don't like the system. Now you're going to put a French dude in charge? Like, bro, uh-uh. So there's anger about that. Number two is we have this unequal social class that's been around since the Spanish first arrived, which if you don't remember, it's the Peninsulares on top. They're Spanish people born in Spain. Then you got the Creoles, full-blooded Spanish, born in the New World or in America. And then we have the people of mixed ancestry, mestizo, mulatto. And then at the bottom, we have Native Americans and those who are enslaved. This group, this group right here, the Creoles, are the most upset about the system. These Creoles believe that because they were educated in Spain, their parents send them back to Spain to get an education, and they come back to Latin America, that they are no worse. They are actually should be equal to the Peninsulares. And it's this group right here, these Creoles, who are going to rise up and try and demand and take power away from the Peninsulares. They, I want to be really, really clear on here, because this is where we get into, like, is this a revolution or is this an independence movement? These guys right here just want to be up at the top. They do not want to make everyone below them equal. They want to take over what these guys have, and they are not fighting for the rights of the majority, which are the Native Americans. They are really just fighting for their own individual rights. And this is the, one of the leaders. His name is Simon Bolivar. He's a military general. He's kind of the George Washington of the Spanish Latin American Revolution. Um, if you ever go to South America today, you will find his picture and his statues everywhere. You'll find towns and cities named after him. You'll find a country named after him, Bolivia. Um, so he's really important. And last but not least is the Enlightenment and other revolutions. And the Enlightenment is going to inspire these Creoles to rise up against the Spanish and the Peninsulares. Um, we have the inspiration from the American, the French, and the Haitian revolutions, which are all going on within a 15-year window. So it's going to inspire them to rise up and rebel. And also just these basic ideas of Enlightenment, freedom, liberty, um, separation of powers, um, the consent of the governed, those are going to be part of this as well. So again, that's a lot going on. We got three revolutions, Latin America, 13 colonies of the American Revolution, and then Haiti. All of them have very similar causes, colonial rule, enlightenment, um, and some kind of unequal treatment that the colonists don't like, which is going to lead people to rise up and rebel. That's a very quick overview. We'll talk about more of this more in class. As always, if you got any questions, do me a favor, write it down, let me know. I'm out.